morning, church. It's great to see you in God's house today and uh, just to be in God's presence. Anybody else just love worshiping God in spirit and in truth with his people? And what a blessing it is to see you. Uh, I just want to welcome you, and I want to ask you if you would help me welcome those that are watching with us through the live stream. Would you put your hands together and make some noise from them? We love y'all. And uh, we love when you're here in person, but that's the next best thing is to be watching with us online. And God bless you for uh, tuning in with us. And I just want to uh, make a few brief announcements, just get some things out of the way and then just let God have his way. It is Christmas season around here, if you didn't notice, by my attire. And uh, we have a lot of great things planned for the month of December. We call it Christmas at Lakeview. And really every week we do something special to celebrate. And I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, dishonor Thanksgiving. I just see that as like the uh, tailgate party before Christmas, you know. <laughs> And so we're excited that that's happening, but we got many, many things. I can't go over them all, but if you'll avail yourself of your worship guides, uh, they've got a handout in there that talks about several of them. And if you ever, you know, don't have access to that, you can go online on your phones, lakeviewpeople.com slash Christmas. It'll have all the dates, all the different events and happenings listed on there. And uh, you can just check that out at any time. I do want to highlight one. It's why I'm wearing uh, this sweater. I actually was planning on wearing this during the month of October, during our Aliens. We did a message series entitled Aliens. If you can't tell, it's like an alien in a Santa outfit. Uh, but it was 95 degrees in October, so I waited to wear it today. Uh, but I, one reason I wear this is because I've got a lot of Christmas sweaters, and Victoria says if I don't wear them, that I can't keep them. So... Uh, this is me. This one's good again until next year. But it's also to remind you that on Sunday, December the 3rd, uh, we're going to be hosting our Christmas Sweater Sunday. It's something special we do uh, each year just to kind of kick off the, uh, the season with something festive and fun. And you're invited to wear your favorite, your best, or your most unique uh, Christmas sweater. And we're going to have photo booths set up for you to take photos with your family, uh, your friends, and also... Uh, if you will uh, allow us to take your photo, we're going to choose three winners from both campuses. Both There'll be three from Iowa Park campus and three from the Vernon campus. So six winners in all. And each one of those winners will receive a $100 Visa gift card for yourself. But also the church is going to be donating $500 in your name to a local charity right here in Wichita County that will go to those in need. So uh, it will be a blessing to you and you'll be a part of being a blessing to somebody else. So we're real excited about that. Again, can't go over all the stuff so check it out online. But one more mention about Thanksgiving with this being Thanksgiving week. Just want to remind you, we won't have any Wednesday night services this week. So kids' life, student life, all of our life groups won't be meeting this Wednesday. We'll pick things up next weekend. We will have Saturday morning prayer if any of y'all uh, want to come out to that at 9 a.m. And then, of course, we'll meet back regular service times uh, next Sunday. Hopefully the turkey can have worn off by then. Uh, but this morning, kind of in part because it is Thanksgiving, this morning is part three of our message series, Identity Crisis. And today's title is, You Are What You Eat. Isn't that what you want to hear right before Thanksgiving dinner? Hallelujah. Uh, but it is true, both physically and spiritually, that, that, that what we allow to get on the inside is going to affect what happens on the outside, the internal impacts, the external. And in case you haven't noticed, I heard some of y'all even whispering, when I was bringing this in uh, to the church today, it's so funny, uh, I have two questions that people always ask me. And today the question was, when do you think Jesus is coming back? And the second question was, who's that cake for? Uh, and I, I brought this out just for a quick object lesson about uh, that what you ingest is important. What you eat is important. Because how many of you know, cake is good. Yeah. Amen. But it's not necessarily good for you. You can say amen or oh me to that. But it's a powerful thing. There are certain things, y'all, that just bring people together. And cake is one of them. I had two really funny, very real things happen this week. I knew, do you ever know, uh, notice how when you've got something on your mind, you notice it more? Like you've never paid attention to a certain car color until you're looking for a car of that color and then you see them everywhere. It's interesting how that happens. I, I wanted a cake to, to kind of share at the beginning of this message, so I knew I was planning to go get one. And I went earlier this week, and it was just funny. I first went to Sam's Club uh, Monday or Tuesday. I don't remember exactly the day of this week. And I went early, you know, when they let the businesses in uh, beforehand. And they were actually doing 
a, a time of honoring one of their associates. One of the, the ladies there had gotten associate of the month. They were being like honored from corporate. It was a big deal. And they were making a presentation there at the snack bar there. And it was pretty neat to see that happening. And as I was leaving, I bumped into two other employees that weren't there because they were, they were working at the time. They weren't as impressed with that employee who was associate of the month. And it was just funny because you don't even have to like somebody to go near them if they're having cake. Because one of them was like, I don't know why they gave that to her. I'm not even going to go say thanks or whatever. And the other one said, well, they bought her a cake and I'll be if about 30 seconds later, both those ladies went over to go congratulate her because there was going to be cake. And another thing about cakes is I went into our, one of our local Walmarts to buy this. And when I went in the door, I, I saw an elderly gentleman who wasn't that gentle at all. You ever said hi to somebody and they just make like an animal noise back at you? That's kind of what happened. And he didn't even speak to me. I was like, hey, sir, how are you? And, you know, whatever. Y'all, he was the guy in front of me in line when I was buying the cake. And all of a sudden, he wanted to be my best friend. <laughs> oh, well, who's that for? Where you go, wherever you, you ever heard the joke, where you ever you're going, I'm going to go with you. You know, it's like, yeah, wouldn't even talk with me before. Now you want to follow me out of the store. You know, got to mace the guy. But cake just brings people together. We know it's a celebration. We know it's for somebody special. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Y'all, there's nothing wrong with cake. But I want to submit to you that if cake is all you ever ate, that would be a problem. There are some good things in cake. Uh, they use milk, you know, which they tell you is, is good for you. Eggs are a good source of protein. So some people are like, well, I'm just getting my milk and eggs every day eating cake. But that's not really how it works because there's other things mixed in with uh, the milk and the eggs. And when you put them all together, especially those processed sugars, those things that we don't really need, if you just got this, you wouldn't really be getting that much nutrition. And there's a lot of things, spiritually speaking, that we take into our heart, that we allow to get into our soul through our ears, through our eyes. The Bible actually calls your eyes the window to your soul. Things that we eat, that we digest, that we let feed us, Have you ever thought it's interesting that on Facebook, the part of that social media platform where you see all the things that other people are saying is called your news feed? I wonder how many times we let external things into our soul that impact the way we think, the things that we do, maybe even the way that we feel about ourselves or the way that we identify ourselves. What you allow into your heart is very, very important. And we have a saying, it's not just a childish saying, that when we get saved, that Jesus comes to live in our heart. And I want you to know that changes everything. And that you want to have the full truth. Because, yeah, there's milk, and yeah, there's eggs and cake, but when you add all that other stuff, it looks good, but it's not nutritious anymore. And does anybody believe with me that the Word of God, otherwise known as the bread of life, doesn't need any artificial sweeteners added to it? It's just the truth. And if we will trust it, if we will believe it and live it, it will be nourishment to our life. It will change our life. And God can use it to help us to change other people's lives as well. I want to look at a scripture in the book of Romans chapter 10. And starting at verse 6, it says, But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up. Aren't you glad you don't have to wait for Jesus to come down from heaven to answer your prayer? And that we don't serve a Savior who has to rise from the dead ever again. He did it one time and once was enough. Praise God. He's alive right now. He's in heaven, but we have access to him. And then next is very, very important scripture. Uh, verses of scripture. All of it's important, but these I want to highlight. Verse 8 says, but what does it say? Well, what it says is that the word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. And what I want you to see here is we don't have to wait for God to like come down. Jesus already came down to the earth to be born and to live and to give his life for us. And Now he's with us. When we say Christ is in us, that's literally what has happened. And you're going to have to believe that by faith. So you you don't have to wait. Uh, Let me just say it this way. You don't have to get all worked up for God to work in your life. You just have to believe that he's there and that what he says goes. 
And what he says does. And that's the word of faith that this is talking about here that we proclaim. And then these are two very important scriptures when it comes to understanding salvation. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And notice the order of things here. You confess and you believe. And I know that scripture says, it's very clear, there's a tension in the church world. It's like, well, what, what is the balance of faith and works. We know that it's by faith that we get saved. The Bible says it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not by works, so nobody can boast. Nobody can brag on it. You can't say that you earned it. You deserved it. But the Bible also says faith without works is dead. So if we're going to be alive in Christ, we ought to be doing something once we give our life to Christ. Amen? But this right here talks about something, and there are those that will get a little uh, nervous about it. Like, well, well wait, if, if you confess with your mouth, then you did something. It's a work you had to do to get saved, and you don't get saved by works. And sometimes, y'all, we just overcomplicate the Bible. What if we would just do what it says and believe what it says? And did you know God didn't make different denominations and all these different religions? He just spoke the truth, and if we listened to the truth, it would change us. It would set us free. Because when it's talking about confession here, it's not a big deal. The Bible says there's, we don't get saved by work so that no one can boast, no one can brag about it. That's speaking to the reality that we don't do anything worth bragging about when it comes to salvation. Jesus is who, who does all the heavy lifting. It's about what he did on the cross. I think of it this way. If somebody gave you a bag of money, like a billion dollars, I can't even imagine what a billion dollars would look like. That'd be a big bag. If for Christmas... I'm talking somebody, Elon Musk, for whatever reason, you responded to one of his posts on Twitter or X or whatever it's called, X marks the spot, you got chosen. He said, I'm going to give you a billion dollars. And it came to your house in a big old bag, and you had to open that bag. Can I tell you, the act of opening that bag did not earn you that money. So just because the Bible says you got to open your mouth and confess that he is Lord, you're receiving the free gift of salvation that's not by anything you did to deserve it. You're just opening it yourself, your heart up to the Lord. Because then when you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. And I think the order is important because sometimes, saints, you got to say something before you even really believe it. you got to be willing to say, that's what the Bible says. Whether or not, because there's a lot of people who I believe you're saved, but you don't believe that. Because you think, well, I know me. I know this stuff. It doesn't matter if you know you and you know how bad you've been or the bad you are. It matters if you know Jesus and how good he is and that you trust him as your savior. The Bible says all of our righteousness. Mother Teresa. Everybody know who Mother Teresa is? Mother Teresa. I feel mean saying this. Mother Teresa's righteousness is like filthy rags before God. Did you know that? When it comes to the way the Bible describes sin, Adolf Hitler's sin, same as anybody else's. But praise be to God, the word also says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And sometimes you need to just declare that over yourself. When you don't feel that way, aren't you glad it wasn't your feelings that got you saved? It is not by feelings we have been saved by grace. It's by faith, not in ourselves. We can't brag about it. We just get to open that gift and enjoy it. And I, I want you to think something else about that money. I would hope you wouldn't just, somebody gave you a billion dollars, you wouldn't just put it up on a nice place and once a week go look at it and sing some songs to it. Invite your friends over. Come look at my bag of money. Hallelujah. But isn't that what we do with Jesus? Oh, I'm saved. Now I go to a building once a week. I'm going to sing some songs about him. I'm going to invite some people with me. No, it's a daily. Y'all, I'd be spending that money. I know what I could do with a billion dollars. Hallelujah. Hope you do too. And we want to spend the time that God has given us, the life that he has gifted us to do some good. Where are we spending our time? Where are we spending our life? What are we doing with what we've got on the inside? Here's the reality that I want you to remember. If you'll write this down, it's, it's in your notes is a couple blanks to fill in. You don't have to do something to be good enough. It's not by works that you're saved. We do good because Jesus is enough. Amen? That's just the best way I could say it to just try to encapsulate the gospel. Is we don't do good works to earn God's love. Aren't you thankful God loved you while you were yet a sinner? Jesus went to the cross for you. We didn't do anything to deserve his love. But because of his love, now we do good works in response to what he's done for us. But 
too many people are still trying to pay for their sins. And we need to realize that God has already bailed us out. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Is again, we don't have to get ourselves all worked up. We don't have to be like other religions that serve some dead God. Did you know every other religious leader has died? Buddha, dead. Muhammad, dead. Every, every other one you want to talk about is dead. Jesus, they tried to kill him and he didn't stay dead. But he's alive forevermore. And we have a new life in Christ. It's different. We're the only faith in the world Jesus said it. He said, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. But he's the only God who lives with us, in us. And that's what makes all the difference. He's there to bail us out. And no, I didn't misspell that. It's a play on words because we're going to look in the book of 1 Kings about the encounter between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Baal is like a scary sounding word and it's a, it's a, a false god and that sounds all bad, but let's look at the scriptures quickly. We're gonna, I'm going to warn you, we're going to read quite a bit of scripture. Is it okay just to read the Bible together in church? There's a thought. Good. I was going to do it anyway, but just thought I'd ask. It says in verse 20, So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between different opinions? You know, you're supposed to follow God, not just limp after him. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And right here, you might be thinking, why would anybody follow Baal instead of following God? But you need to know that in context, Baal wasn't really a bad name back then. In fact, the word Baal translates to the word Lord. It was a Phoenician or Canaanite God that was kind of a, another version of trying to be like a, a counterfeit version, a great value version of the true God. And you need to be careful. Just because somebody says they follow God, you need to make sure what God they're talking about. Because, y'all, there's only one way, Jesus said. That's not my opinion. I'm not the one who made that decision. God did that, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. So right here, people are they're trying to follow both. They're trying to follow the God of their culture. That's Baal. And the God that they know is real. And how many of us, we say we wouldn't follow Baal, but we're still following old ideologies from the world. We're still living in a way that we used to live before we gave our life to Jesus. So we're still kind of trying to serve both. And when he said this, you know, choose who you'll follow, it says the people did not answer him a word. So then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Ever, anyone ever felt lonely following Jesus? Like maybe you're the only person at your job, the only person in school. The only one in your family? I don't know. <laughs> it's almost Thanksgiving time. You ever been sitting around with a bunch of your family and you're thinking, how am I related to these people? <laughs> you just feel lonely. But Elijah was one prophet. There's 450 prophets of Baal. And he says in the next verse, let two bulls be given to us. And let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God. So they're going to speak. They're going to say something. And I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And anytime you see Lord in all caps there, he's speaking the name of the one true God. It's not, he's not just saying like Lord. That's, that's our word like Elohim or where you would say Yahweh or even Jehovah God. He's, he's letting them know what God he's talking to. And it ain't Baal. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. They agreed this would be a fair competition. Then Elijah, in the next verse, said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull, here's, here's where they're getting it set up, and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered, and they limped around, bless their little hearts, they limped around the altar that they had made. Now, it's important to know a few things about Baal. This Canaanite or Phoenician god is, many believe, where the Grecians based the god Zeus upon. He was kind of their head god. 
And he's depicted in artistic writings as holding a lightning bolt. And that phrase there, when Elijah would have said, call down fire from heaven, that would have been familiar in their culture. That was what they would say to describe lightning striking the earth. Because they knew that when lightning struck, it could cause fires. We've seen that happen here, even out, you know, just in the fields when it's dry, storms, a lightning strike can start a, a, a grass fire, wildfire. So they knew that term, calling down fire from heaven. And do you think it's interesting that God impressed upon his prophet to challenge the, the God of Baal to something he should have been good at. He's the one holding the lightning bolt. So he said, let's see who can call down fire from God. And look, we say something a lot, but right here when it says nobody answered them, there's a song about it, there's scripture about it. I love declaring it, that we serve a God who's alive. Anybody glad that our God's not dead? But let me let you know, these other ones, they are. They dead. And the enemy that we fight against, let me give you a picture of our God. This all seems like a big setup, like a battle, like a competition. It's no competition, okay? They might have been, Elijah might as well have been facing the Dallas Cowboys because he was going to win. <laughs> that hurt me. That hurt me to say. The reality is God God does, the enemy might fight against us. The devil might fight against God's people. But I need you to know something. God doesn't have to fight against the devil. He's already kicked him out of heaven. Like that, Jesus said. I saw Satan fall like lightning. And again, here's the lightning in this battle. God's already won the war. We just have to decide what side will we be on. The decision's already been made. Elijah, even being the only one, sided with the one true God. And so these prophets of Baal are limping around. Oh, they've been from morning till noon saying this. And at noon, verse 27 says, at noon, Elijah mocked them saying, cry aloud, get louder, for he is a God. Either he is musing or he's relieving himself. And for all the children in the room, my wife always gets on to me because I got three boys and I don't care how old you are, just for whatever reason, potty humor is funny to me. And she'll be like, when are you going to grow up? And I want to say, as soon as the prophet Elijah grows up, that's when I will. Because he said, Baal's relieving himself or perhaps he's on a journey or perhaps he's asleep and he must be awakened. And they cried aloud. And this is crazy. Their dedication to this, I guess in some ways is respectable, but it's so ridiculous. And I see people all the time give so much energy to things that are no good to them. It says they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. Have you ever observed somebody standing up for a cause and it doesn't even, why are they even, it's not even important. But they'll fight you about it. I mean, it's just, that's kind of what is happening here. They're, they're so deceived. And it hurts my heart that they're, they're harming themselves to try to get this false God to do something. In verse 29 it says, And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. So next comes Elijah in the next verse. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And that phrase is important. Come near to me. And all the people did. They came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. And I know that this isn't an exact metaphor, but the reality is, church, the body of Christ really doesn't need some new fad or new trend. Amen. We need to get back to what God's Word says. Yeah. Just let it be the truth, and the truth will set us free. And the Bible says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus is the Word. So if we want to be like Jesus, we should want to be like the Word. That's one of his names. He's the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. We're going to have a whole message series in the month of December entitled, Why Was I Born? Talking about why Jesus decided to live his life and give his life for us, but also, why were you created? Because you have a purpose that was given to you by God, whether you believe it or not, is the question. So right here, Elijah's saying, come near to me and let's rebuild the altar of God. Let's get back to the things that, that God had established. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel will be your name. So he changed Jacob's name to Israel, if you didn't know that. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said, 
Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And I don't know if Elijah's ever made a fire, but this is not how I was taught to do it. And then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And again, you're going to see a phrase in the next verse. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, which that word there is talking about a specific offering that the Israelites were commanded to do. And it was different than the offerings done by other religions and other gods because they would offer things to their God to get their God to do something for them. Like Baal, part of his purpose, he was the God of fertility and the God of storms. That's why he had the lightning bolt was because he controlled the weather. And so they would make offerings to him to, to pray to him to help them to be prosperous and to give them offspring and that they would reproduce. And they would also you know, make offerings to him to, to get him to send rain and all these things. But this offering of oblation is different and it's only done to the one true God because this is an offering that if you study it out uh, in the Hebrew culture, it was not just an offering to get God to do something, but it was an offering to get God to come close to you. Because we serve a God who doesn't want to just be this God way away. He comes to dwell among his people, in our hearts, in our lives. He cares about you. He's not just sitting up there and you got to pay some penance to him. And again, I'm concerned about people losing their identity in this world and not knowing who they are. It breaks my heart that people think, well, because I've been trapped in addiction that forever I'm an addict. That because I've been a victim of abuse, I'm always going to be damaged goods. I'm always going to be a victim. Praise be to God that the word says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. You're not who you used to be. You're not what somebody did to you or what anybody said to you or even what you believe about yourself. You are what God's word says about you. But for you to really believe that, you've got to trust and have faith that God loves you so much that he wants to be around you. And so many people, they know that they should love God, but they struggle believing that God will love them, that he'd ever want to be around you because of the things you've done or even the things you're doing. And I want to just tell you, even in the Old Testament, it was very clear. God loves his people. He wants to be with his people. And this sacrifice was made to draw him close to people. So Elijah the prophet came near. There's, you'll see that phrase all throughout this story. And he said, O oh Lord. He wanted to make sure they knew what Lord he was talking about. O oh Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Israel, which is Jacob. His name was changed. He said, let it be known this day, if you can go back to the, the previous scripture, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. A couple of important things here. First of all, he wanted them to know he was the God of their nation. And I know that America says we're one nation under God, but we've gotten away from that too much. And y'all, it's not the government's fault. It's the church's fault. The Bible doesn't say if the government will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then I will hear them from heaven and heal their land. It says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. That's written to God's people. And there's some things that we need to get back to if we want to see our nation get back to the way that God wants it to be. It says here, I want them to know that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. It's important that people know you're a follower of Jesus. There ain't no such thing as an undercover Christian. You're either all in or you're not. And you need to let people know that Christ is in your life. That's why I'm so proud. We got a brother going to be water baptized at the end of service today. Just go in public, letting people know this is an important step of faith. And he, he knows God. He's already saved. It ain't nothing magic about that, that I will park water. But it's something significant about letting people know I am proud. I'm doing what Jesus commanded me to do. And I want them to know you're God of Israel and that I am your servant. And he said that I have done these things at your word. And I would ask you to maybe underline that. Find a way to remember that phrase, at your word. Because I'm going to move on, but I want to call back to that later in the message. Let me move quickly. He goes on to say, answer me, O Lord. Look how Elijah prayed. No fanfare. He said, answer me, O Lord. Answer me. That this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Does anybody in here have lost loved ones that more than anything else you want them to know Jesus Christ? 
Y'all, I've got people that, if I'm being real with you, I don't even really like them, but I love them. I've been watching the news some lately. I try not to watch it too much because it ain't usually good news. But sometimes certain politicians or people, you ever yell at the TV as if they can hear you? Am I the only one that messed up? <laughs> people just, I'll just see them and I get mad. But God's been helping me. I've started to pray for them instead of just yell at them. Because you know what? God loves them. And but for the grace of God, there go I. Because I've sure been wrong about things before. And I wonder if the church would be that way, if we would pray that way. That God answer our prayer. That people may know that you are God. Not, I'm not trying to be right. I want to be righteous. I don't want to win an argument. I want to win souls. I want to see lives transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to confess to you, I hadn't seen one person go to heaven yet because of somebody's politics. It is the message of Jesus Christ. He is the only way. He is the only truth. He's the only life. Nobody comes to God but by him. So let's let everything else be secondary and let him be most important. Let them know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. He just prayed this simple prayer. Elijah didn't have a bunch of chanting. He didn't take him all day. He didn't cut himself and do some ritual. He must not have gone to preacher school. He forgot to call the band back up. When you're going to pray and you want people to feel it, you got to have somebody. I wish I could just have them follow me around throughout my day when I talk to people, you know, wherever I go. Just start playing that soft music. Dun, dun. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Whatever. It'd just make my day better. He didn't have any of that. He just knew he is the prophet of God, heard directly the word of God. He heard his voice. And y'all, we, you say, I wish God would speak to me. Oh, he has. And he wrote it down. So you can look at it again and again and again. And it's just as true, it's just as real today as it was when it was penned thousands of years ago because the Holy Spirit's the one who spoke through the, the authors of this book. It's a living word. And when you know the word of God, that's the problem. We read last week that people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. Many people don't know who they are in God because they don't know what God's word says about them. That's why you're still believing the lie that you're broken and you're so addicted and you're this, that, and the other. And I tell you, no, do what God's word says and believe what God's word says about you. You're not just some dirty sinner saved by grace. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The old is dead, the Bible says. The the new is here. Your spirit man has been made brand new in Jesus Christ. Yeah, your body may have to catch up with it, but if you quit eating cake spiritually and start feeding your soul, you are what you eat. It will transform. It will renew your mind. It'll change the way you think. It'll change the way you speak. It'll change the way you live. And you don't need that to go to heaven. It's just by faith in Jesus, but we need that so we can help other people find the way to heaven through the lives that we live. I want to just read the last of this scripture, and then I'm going to ask Hannah if she'll come help me bring this thing in for a landing. He says, answer me, O God, that they would know you're the Lord, and you've turned their hearts back. Then verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, this is so powerful, when the people saw what God did, then they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. And if that ain't good enough, they said it again. The Lord, he is God. This is my prayer. I believe that God still does miracles because I've seen too many of them. You came too late to tell me God doesn't still do miracles. I've seen it in my life and in my family. We've seen it in our church even recently. God doing things that could only be. He, God will share his glory with no one that only he could take credit for. And he's still doing them today. So, I believe that God can still send down fire. And I, I don't know this 100% theologically, but sometimes I just like to get the religion out of the way and just have a childlike faith. I've heard different observations or theories about why Elijah poured the water. It never says that God specifically told him to dig a trench and pour water on the sacrifice. It's not in the Bible, but he did it. And I just believe that in part, it was because he knew so much that the power of God was so real that nothing could snuff it out. And it was going to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt this was not some trick, this was not a magic trick or something that could be conjured up. This had to be the power of God because it said it, it consumed everything. And I want to declare to the church today, anybody listening under the sound of my voice or tuning in online, whatever, wherever you're at in your life, I want you to know no matter what's been dumped on you, 
that other people may have put on you or even you've put burden on yourself. It's nothing that the power of God can't cut through, can't, can't get out of the way so that God can transform your life. There's not supposed to be fire when there's all this water. And you might be saying, well, I just, I just want to be a good person, but I grew up in abuse. I grew up in such a broken home. I'm never going to be a good dad. I'm never going to be a good husband. I'm never going to be a good wife or mom. Whatever lie that the enemy's telling you, you're like, all this stuff is against me. All this stuff's been piled up. All I've known, I come from a long line of addiction. I come from a long line of pain. I come from a long line of whatever it might be. I want to tell you, no, you trace your lineage all the way to heaven. You have a heavenly father that doesn't care about your last name or your bank account. He just sees you as his child. And he says, I can change you. I've got the power. Baal with his little lightning bolt is nothing but some action figure, some mascot. God is not a mascot. He's real. His power is alive. And he has the power to touch you in your life, to change your situation, no matter how bad it looks, no matter how much has been piled on. And I want you to hear this. God spoke it to me as I was praying before this service. You don't even have to get all the way out of your situation for God to get glory out of your situation. You want to know in part why that was so impressive what God did was because of how bad it was before he did it. It had all the water and the trench and all. It shouldn't have happened. So you're sitting here in a situation going, nobody but God can save me. That's not a bad place to be. Because then when people see you, you'll say, who would believe that I could be changed? The ones that know you, the ones that have been around you are going to be the ones that God can use you to reach. When they'll say, oh my gosh, she's not who she used to be. He's not the way he used to be. Something's changed. And maybe if God, you didn't know me before I was a preacher, man. And I want to tell you, if God can do it for me, he can do it for anybody. Praise be the name of the Lord. So we got a brother who's going to go public and, and just let people know, look, what God's done in his life. He's proud of it. He wants everybody to know because God's calling him to do some great things. And I, I'm just going to dismiss you now, Kenton. If you want to go ahead and get ready, they're going to get the kids down from Kids Church for us, and uh, they're going to join us. Before we do that, I'm going to call the worship team back. If y'all would come and get ready, they're going to lead us in a time of worship before we have baptism. I'm going to share two scriptures while they're coming that aren't in your notes, but they'll be on the screen. But write them down. Look them over on your own time. Because these are things Jesus said that may be hard for you to believe. That you need to digest it. Let it resonate in your heart so it can live out in your life. Because sometimes we have an easier time believing the things, the lies about us than we do the truth about us. You are what you eat. What will you allow in your heart? The lies of your experiences or your situation or the truth of God's word and the salvation that's been paid for you by Jesus Christ. Because there's great things that come along with being saved. Jesus said in the book of John chapter 14, this is crazy stuff. You think the Old Testament's got the, the market cornered on crazy miraculous stuff? This is New Testament. This is a new covenant. This is Jesus Christ's words, not just some, you know, emotional preacher. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. And you say, whoa, that's so hard for my mind to believe that I'll do greater works. Y'all, don't believe your mind. Believe Jesus. The Bible says, don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. God has things for you to do beyond what you could ever comprehend. In fact, if you probably knew what he wanted you to do, it would, it would freak you out. That's why he just tells it to you one step at a time. You're going to look back and say, look what God has done with my life. If you'll just live your life for God and just follow Jesus, just with that childlike faith, say, whatever you say, I'm going to believe and I'm going to do. And he says, these greater things I'll do because, why? Because I'm going to the Father. The next scripture says, whatever you ask in my name. You know what the Greek word is for whatever? Whatever. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Then he says it again. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now that phrase that I had you underline earlier where Elijah said, uh, you know, Lord, I did this according to your word. Let him know that I've done all these things at your word. That's Old Testament. It was before the Messiah had come, before Jesus had walked in the flesh. And how many of you know the Bible says that Jesus was the word who became flesh? 
And it's the same sentence structure. The New Testament's written in Greek. When anytime you read it saying, do this in my name, it's like the Old Testament version of saying, do this according to my word. Because Jesus is the word who's come alive. He's letting you know the word works. The word is real because he is real. So if the Bible says it, God will always keep his promises. So if the Bible says it, God will do it. Anybody just going to believe the Bible? Would you give God praise right there? He's able. Ask anything in my name, I will do it. There's a last scripture I'm going to read you. It's Mark chapter 16. Write this down so you can look at it later. Mark chapter 16, verses 14 through 20. Crazy stuff. I'm glad the kids are coming in so they can hear this. Because I tell you, these little ones, they're quicker to believe this sometimes than us adults. They don't know any better than to just trust the Bible. And I watch God do miracles through those babies. Sometimes I, want kid, I, I ask my kids to pray for me often before I ask anybody else. Because they don't know any better than just to believe that Jesus can do anything. Afterward, Jesus appeared to the eleven. That's his disciples. He appeared to him themselves as they were reclining at the table. And he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Jesus never rebuked somebody for asking him to do too much. But he oftentimes would get on to people for not asking him to do enough. He'd be like, is that all you want? You know, is that all you think I can do? He says, he, didn't rebu he rebukes them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, here's the great commission. Everybody believes this. Jesus said, go into all the world. Do y'all believe we're supposed to do this? Yes. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And then he says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. It's so awesome. We got somebody being baptized today. And whoever does not believe will be saved condemned. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Either you believe or you don't. And right now, I don't want to be crude or rude, but it's a sad thing that science and society seems to have suddenly had a hard time figuring out the difference between a man and a woman. There are just certain things, and I don't know what to do with my hands while I say this, there's certain areas that just reveal whether you're a man or a woman. Is that plain enough? There are certain things the Bible says that will reveal whether you're a believer or not. Right here it says, whoever believes... Not the ones that really believe, the ones that have just made it to that level. No, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. So how do you know if you're a believer? Thank you for asking. Jesus answers it in the next verse. He says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. And I'm so sick of the devil lying to us, making people believe that somehow he's stronger than God. And we'll believe that demons are real and they torment us and do all these things. But we act like as followers of God that we don't have any power. That we don't have access to anything. That's not what Jesus said. And I'm just going to have that childlike faith. Because I've seen too much. God's done too much for me to not believe that he can't do anything. Because right here it says, these signs will accompany those. Jesus says it. Read it. It's in red in your Bible. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands and if they drink, and it says, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. Notice right there, it's not saying to go pick up serpents or drink poison on purpose. But how many of you know, sometimes you ain't looking for a snake, but a snake finds you. And sometimes people will, will just bring poison into your life. It doesn't matter what the enemy or anybody else brings against you. It's letting you know by faith in Jesus Christ, those things won't damage you. They will not destroy what God has called you to do. It goes on to say, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You know why I believe this? Not because of some denomination. God didn't make denominations. All denominations got their problems because they got people. So let's just believe it because the Bible says it. Jesus said it. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after Jesus, at the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up to heaven. What did he say in that other scripture we read? I will do this because I'm going to the Father. In, in John 14, he said, greater works than, I, than what I did you will do because I'm going to the Father. Right here he spoke these amazing things. And after he'd spoken them, he went up into the heavens and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And then they did their part. Verse 20. They went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message with the accompanying signs. I want people to know that God is real. I believe you do too. I want to ask you if you would to just prepare your hearts. We're about to celebrate with this brother who's going to be water baptized. But I want you to be just letting God speak to you. And if you need prayer for something today, after the baptism ceremony, 
We're just going to dismiss you. The worship team is going to lead you in worship while we get ready for baptism. We're going to do that song, This Is How I Fight My Battles. And the thing is, you don't have to like fight the enemy. You just have to learn to walk in the victory Jesus has already given you. And if you have a need for healing in your body, in your marriage, in your life, in your mind, whatever, Jesus said, they'll lay hands on the sick. They'll lay hands on those who have need and they will recover. And either Jesus is telling the truth or he's a liar. Spoiler alert, he's not a liar. And so after this ceremony, we're going to open these altars. And anybody that wants prayer, the prayer team will be available. And it ain't because of who's laying hands on you. It's because we're doing what the Bible said and laying hands on you. And just going to believe for God to do what only he can do. And just like that fire came down from heaven, I'm believing for God to confirm his word in this place in the name of Jesus. Would you believe that way with me? Could I ask you to stand all over this place and just let's go to the Lord and worship. Hannah and the team are going to lead us. I'm going to go get ready for the baptism ceremony. But will you just sing out? Can we just worship God in spirit and in truth and just create an atmosphere just of where we just have trust in him We say, God, we're just going to believe you at your word and believe your word to do what it says in the name of Jesus. Let's worship God. There's a table that you prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me See, this is how I find my brother in Christ and uh, I'm just so proud to be part of this moment. Uh, this is a man that gave his heart to God. You were telling me it was a little later on in life and just had never been baptized but you've been living your life for God, even serving him and ministering. God's doing great things but man even greater things are ahead. And I remember getting to baptize your kids Bo and Paisley. That was back I think in July this summer. Just Anybody else glad to see a man of God leading his family? Praise God. So he just wanted to lead by example and uh, be baptized publicly. And also God's calling him to step into some things. And I'm just excited for what he's got for you, brother. So Kenton, just before this gathering of witnesses, your church family, before God, do you publicly profess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll take it. And it's my honor, brother, to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
If I could ask the, the prayer team to come forward at this time. And man, that's just that outward expression of what God's done on the inside. Been made brand new in Jesus' name. And I want to give the invitation. And, and I might even ask... Uh, ladies, I know Hannah's kind of tied down, but Victoria, Barbie, Stacy, anybody, Pastor Mark, would you come just with the prayer team? And if you need prayer for anything, will you please not leave this place until you let us just do what the Word says? Lay hands on you, come into agreement. And do y'all believe God still does miracles? We've been seeing it happen. And I would hate to see you leave without receiving what God wants you to receive. So I'm just going to pray a prayer of dismissal, and they're going to worship us out. You're not interrupting me, though. Let me pray a blessing over you. And if you need to go, you're dismissed. But if you need prayer, would you move right from where you're at? Uh, this altar area is open. We stand ready to pray with you. And we'll take as long as you need. Would you bow your heads, bow your hearts with me? God, I want to thank you for your word, that it is powerful, that it's unchanging. And I just am believing right now for you to do the miraculous, the 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 things that you will share your glory with no one, God. Do mighty things in this place and in our lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Will somebody give God praise as you're leaving? You guys are dismissed. If you need prayer, we'll come and pray with you as long as you need. They're going to send you out worshiping. God bless y'all. Y'all are dismissed. Go with God.